Okay, so I'm going to go back to the beginning for this, just briefly. Um, normally what I'm going to do with these lectures, and there's pretty much one per chapter, and this one is about typical in length. Um, so usually it will take us one day to, to do these sort of notes on the chapter, and then a second day I'm going to use for whatever political philosophers usually we're going to talk about. So today, for this era, it's really Plato. Okay, so um, we talked a little bit last time about the ancient debate. Does anybody remember what the two sides were when we went over this? In this debate, yes? Realism and idealism. And the majority of you said that you are realists. Okay? And that not handsome guy there is... Anybody remember? Socrates. Socrates. Okay. So, we did talk a little bit about realism and idealism. Um, we'll talk about what's called the sophists. Uh, we talked about spa. These are all the things we're going to cover in this lecture. Um, utopias. Hawaiian history, people who had before Hawaiian history, remember what a utopia is? Yeah? What is it? Um, an idea for a perfect society. Perfect society, good. Um, and then we'll go over all these political ideologies. Now, as we do that, it's important to keep in mind the question, why? Why are we even learning this? And for this class, it's a pretty easy answer. We're in the middle of one of the most insane political uh, presidential races that we've ever seen. I mean, one thing that I'm trying to emphasize to all my students, political science and Hawaiian history, is that this is not normal. What we're seeing with Trump is not normal. And I, I'm saying that because if you're learning about elections by watching this one, then you're getting a very, very warped and distorted idea about how elections work. Now, in some ways, this election does illustrate some political concepts, but uh, I'll... My view is that that's not a good thing. That those concepts that it's illustrating are not things that we really want to see happening. Anyway, that'll make more sense when we get to that. Okay, so uh, a lot of the political statements that are being made these days will fall into one of these camps. So when you understand what these different views are, if you can get to the point where you can almost predict what the one side is going to say, the other side is going to say. And there's not only two sides. It's not only idealists, realists, liberals, conservatives. It's more complicated than that. Okay, so let's get into it. Um, did it help to watch the Batman film when you got to the reading? Yeah? So the first thing they talk about is Batman, um, the sound effects in the old Batman, right? Kapow and all of that, and then how much better the new Batman is, and then it got right into talking about Harvey Dent, uh, also known as Two-Face, and how you see idealism and realism in the same person, in that case. Um, and then I actually talked about this yesterday, how these, these, this debate between the two sides can get projected all the way up to the international level. Talked a little bit about Star Wars. Um, Han Solo and Luke Skywalker. I think that there are a lot of us who are like Luke Skywalker, but we really wish that we were more like Han Solo. What do you think? Because Han Solo, he's cool. Right? Luke is not so cool, he's, he's something else. He's kind of vulnerable. Yeah? He puts his heart on his sleeve. He's not as cool, but really, the story is really about him. Uh, and Han Solo, like Harvey Dent, he actually goes in the other direction. He goes from a realist to an idealist, if you ever were to watch the films, which I recommend that you do. Um, and then actually, in the latest one, what happens? 
with Han Solo. Anybody see episode seven? Yes. Yes. What happens? Yes. Okay, but at the end of his life, what's he doing? He kind of goes back to being a realist, right? He goes back to smuggling, he's dealing with all these low lives. Yeah? So he goes from realist to idealist back to realist, I would say. Oh. Um, <laughs> uh, you probably didn't think of that when you were watching the movie, right? You just look at the special effects. But, um, but these themes are there, and that's why I keep saying politics is everywhere. Um, and so, I, I don't know what, the, the only other thing I would want to say is that I, I, I would bet that there's a lot of us who are idealists, who pretend to be realists just because being a realist is safer, right? You don't look naive, right? We see that in the sovereignty movement, which was brought up yesterday. Uh, anybody who's for independence is considered to be like a dreamer. Like how could you have those kinds of dreams. But we all have dreams, right? We just don't tell everybody. Right? It might not be a dream of independence, it might be some other dream, but probably that dream is hard to get to. So I would say, you don't need to become a realist just because uh, you think other people are gonna think better of you. Now on the other hand, it's it's hard to be an idealist. In some cases, you really under, need to understand how the system actually works. You need to be somewhat of a realist as well. So that's partly what this class is. Why are you taking this class? What are you really going to get out of it? Well, no, in the long term, <laughs> um, if you start having problems in your New York community, like say Monsanto, is poisoning your kids. That's happening on Kauai and on Molokai, right? In fact, on Sunday I was at a rally at the Olani Palace. Was anybody there? Yeah? Sure. So tell us about it. <coughs> uh, I went. What was it about? That's, that's the question. So it was kind of just this gathering of people. Um, The messaging wasn't very good, actually. Yeah, I didn't think so. It, I think a lot of people went for a lot of different reasons, and there wasn't really just one concrete reason. Like, yeah. A lot of people went because they heard people who were involved in the care movement were going to be there, <clears throat> so they thought they should be involved. And then there were some people there still talking about like Kanai on the wall, who, mm. Some people who were there who were talking about Monsanto. There was just a lot of different problems, and a lot of people who to address those problems, but it's kind of like a mixing pot of all of them. Good. Um, and, and the sponsor of the move of the rally was the Shaka movement, which is not a sovereignty group. Um, it's I believe it's an anti-GMO group on Kauai. But um, one speaker actually said something really good was that we're all here for different reasons, but the unifying factor is Aloha Aina. Aloha Aina, whether it's literal, whether it's um, literally taking care of the land physically, or the other meaning, the metaphorical meaning of aloha aina, which is what? Hui aloha aina, if you call yourself an aloha aina, what does it mean? Patriot. Patriots for the Hawaiian kingdom. So, I think that's what, what we saw with that rally. That rally was different from most of the others that I've been to. Anyway, um, I was going to bring the shirt to show you guys, uh, but it's just another example of politics being all around us. Um, okay. Okay, going back. Um, remember the acronym SPA, S P A, but you might actually want to add another A on there, S P A A. And the second A is Alexander, that is Alexander the Great. This is a lineage of teachers. Socrates taught Plato, Plato taught Aristotle, and Aristotle taught Alexander the Great. Anybody see the movie with very poorly cast Colin Farrell as Alexander the Great? It was a while ago now, but um, I used to show that in world history 
These three are philosophers, so that's why there's only three on there. But Alexander was a conqueror. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Anybody else need a paper? Okay, so the, um, Alexander was a conqueror, and what he did was kind of apply the philosophies of these thinkers to the real world. And what he did was he conquered um, a huge part of Europe and Asia, we call Asia Minor. Um, he created the largest empire that the world had seen up to that point. This is around 350 BC. And... Uh, and when he conquered those places, he didn't just devastate them. He actually turned them somewhat into Greek kinds of society. So he started these, I think he had 20 cities all called Alexandria. But the most famous one was in Egypt. And the library at Alexandria was the greatest library in the history of the world. Um, up to that point, possibly ever. Um, there's another Facebook meme that goes around that says, you know you're a serious historian if you're still upset about the burning of the library at Alexandria. You know, two, three thousand years later. And I'm someone who falls into that category. So who are these, these thinkers who were so incredibly influential? Well, Socrates was a guy who never actually wrote anything. He went around basically being annoying by questioning people and questioning all their beliefs. Um, and that got him into quite a bit of trouble. Uh, he called himself a gadfly, like an irritating fly that's always buzzing around your, around your head, except this fly is asking you philosophical questions, which often they didn't realize were philosophical at the time. They just seemed really annoying. The reason he didn't write anything is he thought that philosophy needs to be lived in the streets. Now, he was lucky enough to live in a society, uh, Athens, which valued philosophy and had a very educated population. Now, of course, when I say population, I'm talking about the, the top tier of the society. It was about uh, 30,000 people who could uh, participate fully. That was, those were men who were Greek, um, who owned property, who could vote. It was a democracy. But then it was built up upon a slave society. So when we, we try not to um, talk about Athens as if it's a total utopia, perfect society. It wasn't. There were about 300,000 people in Athens, and about 30,000 of them were fully participating. OK, so among those 30,000, though, they had some of the great thinkers or, and also just people who had read or spoken with other of, of these great thinkers. Um, Socrates ended up being killed by the state of Athens for, uh, they, they said, corrupting the youth, making them too much questioning. Something that you guys should be thinking about right now. Because we're here in a school that went through a gigantic scandal in the 90s for being corrupt, absolutely corrupt to the core. Right? Well, mostly it was corrupt at the top, but certainly trickled down quite a ways down into the school. You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Bishop of State. Bishop of State, trust, trustee scandal. <coughs> um, some people think we're moving back in that direction, or even that we're almost back to that level of problems. We're just not really talking about it. Others would say that's, that's not the case. But certainly there's always a place for critiquing the society that you're in, and this is the society that you're in. Kamehameha is like <coughs> its own universe, in a way. Right? You can live completely in the school and not really be aware of anything outside of it, because it just sucks you in completely. Right? But as you get sucked in, you don't want to be like a blind follower of the Kamehameha faith. 
right? Especially we just had reunion week, everybody's like, oh, uh, blue and white, all this. But is this a utopia? Is Kamehameha a utopia? No. Because most utopias are places like Narnia, and the Garden of Eden, and Hogwarts School, um, the Wizarding World, right? What do those all have in common? Fiction. They're fiction. They're all fiction. Okay, Eden is a real place. <laughs> it's in Iraq. It's in Iraq. Is it a perfect society? In Iraq, no. But it's a real place. I'm not saying Eden is fiction, but... Uh, I don't want to get too much sidetracked, but this, this is just kind of funny. You know, Eden was really just a, a grassy wetland, which was considered like a perfect place because it had a lot of water and it could grow a lot of food. But it was like people would live on these floating platforms. So their house would be on this platform and they'd drink the water off of this side of the platform and go to the bathroom off the other side. Just a lot of grass and a kind of a marsh, like Hawaii Nui Marsh. Yeah. So if you live like in Kaneohe or Kailua or a lot of places here, you live in a place nicer than the Garden of Eden. Think about that. And yet, because most of us don't pay attention, we're letting companies like Monsanto come in and trash a place that's nicer than the Garden of Eden. That's what's happening because of a lack of political engagement. So I'm, I keep coming back to these things because this is why this class is important. Not the six credits, that's nice. But to learn how to engage in your own society. If you don't like something, how do you change it? Right? I mean, this is really important. If you have a problem with uh, your local school, which most people with public schools, they do. I'm not just saying that to be insulting. You know, out of the 50 states, Hawaii's public education ranks 51st. How is that even possible? Washington. That's how bad it is. Washington, D.C. Now, Washington, D.C. is not known for good schools, is it? They have horrible schools. Hawaii is worse. Detroit, their schools are like falling on the kids. <laughs> Hawaii is worse. Hawaii spending is less. Teacher salaries are less. And the spending per pupil is less. That's why you're sitting in these rooms right now. Because your parents know if you go to those schools, you're not going to be middle class. That's why you're here. Okay, so this is what we call understanding the political reality you live in. There's a historical and political reason why you're sitting right here right now. Yeah? Because if you can get out of those schools, then you have a chance. You have a chance. You have about a 50% chance because that's a graduation rate from college. Ekumemeha is about 48, 50%. Anyway, that's why you're sitting here too, because we're trying to get that rate up by giving you a head start. We're giving you a six credit head start right here this summer. Can you see what's going on? Okay. This is why we're here. Uh, it's not because Pawahi and the, no, it's <laughs> real politics happening right now. Okay. It all kind of goes back to these guys again. Socrates taught Plato. Plato is the one who wrote things down. And we'll uh, watch a little video about Plato. Um, a lot of what he wrote were called, they weren't novels. They were called dialogues. They were discussions between Socrates and other people. So Socrates is always the star of the show that Plato wrote. And so you can see how, play, how Socrates function if you read those. And I, I uploaded one of those dialogues to your Laulima. Um, Plato was there when Socrates was uh, executed. He was forced to drink poison. And this picture here, that's Socrates. That's the cup of poison. This is the people who are turning away because they're so upset to see the greatest philosopher in Athens being executed. But he's not even looking at the thing. He's still making another philosophical point 
in his last seconds of life. This is a great uh, painting by the French painter David uh, called The Death of Socrates. Okay, so these, these ideas that go all the way back to ancient, uh, ancient Greece are still kind of with us. In Star Wars and Batman and Narnia. Okay, so um, what a, a lot of the goal of political uh, the study of politics is to create a perfect society or something as close to a perfect society as possible. Now, there is no perfect society, but what do you guys think about well, what is the best that the world has done so far? What is, did they actually have a ranking of the happiest countries in the world? And take a guess what's number one. Norway. Sorry? Norway. Norway. That's very close. Maybe in some rankings it is. Huh? Finland? Okay, you guys are uh, totally right in the right area. Uh, it's the Scandinavian countries, often Denmark, which is, there's four Scandinavian countries, right? Finland, Norway, Denmark, and Sweden. Um, Denmark often comes out number one, and we'll talk about why, why that is. It's not a coincidence. It's not the United States. Um, it's not the Hawaiian Kingdom either. But um, the reason why they've come out at the top, is still not a utopia, has to do with these political ideologies. Um, but one thing about utopia is it's often used as a vision. So they always, uh, political activists, they try to push people to take action to move towards their vision of a perfect society. I mean, that's what ISIS is doing. Right? Everybody knows what ISIS is. This Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, ISIS. Their political vision is an Islamic state, but that does not recognize any national boundaries. So one thing that they'll do is they'll go to the, a national border, like the border between Iraq and Syria, and they'll bring bulldozers, and they'll, if there's like a, a hill there, they'll bulldoze it down and say, we don't recognize any of these. Um, it's a perfect society in their view that has slavery. Uh, if you're an infidel, if you don't believe in um, Allah in the correct way, you can be enslaved. And they are enslaving people. Um, and then the ultimate utopia is heaven. A lot of, we, we had a terrorist act like today or yesterday. Um, well, Sunday there was one, right? Where was it? Pulse. Orlando, yeah, 50 dead, 50 injured, um, that was someone who claimed allegiance to ISIS, and then this morning I heard on the radio in France there was a, yeah, who was also a police officer, yeah, right, so, Often we see these kind of copycat crimes. Now their, their ultimate utopia, because often they, they, they get themselves killed in this, and their, their ultimate utopia is their version of heaven where you're surrounded by 40 virgins. And they really believe that's gonna happen. Otherwise, I mean, otherwise it would be hard to get them to blow themselves up. But utopias are very powerful in terms of getting people to do something that they otherwise wouldn't do. By the way, I just told you the definition of power. You said politics is about power. Power is just what I just said. The ability to get someone to do something. Not something they were already going to do something they otherwise would not.
Okay, so when I say power, people, you know, young people tend to think lightning bolts shooting out of your fingertips or Harry Potter waving a wand around, but no. We're talking about the ability to have an effect on the world by influencing the actions of others. Okay, and utopias are used in this way. You can get people to do something that they otherwise wouldn't. Blow yourself up at age 21 because there's a greater vision of the beyond. And another thing used in that, to that purpose is ideologies. So I mentioned this word yesterday. Um, <coughs> okay, so what is an ideology? Uh, ideology is at a midpoint between a theory. So a theory is just an explanation of how things happen. Right, so the theory of evolution is a theory, right? Uh, organisms evolve. That's how we got all the organisms that exist now. An ideology is a, 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 a philosophy built around that theory. So you might call yourself an evolutionist. I'm someone who my whole um, political... Uh, my political beliefs are based around this idea of evolution. I'm an evolutionist. I believe in the ideology of evolution. And then at its extreme is dogma. Dogma is, you ever know people who, no matter what you say to them, they'll, they'll never change their beliefs? <laughs> Maybe you don't know, do, do you guys know people like that? Probably they're adults. Because when you're a teenager, you're not quite, you haven't formed the ideas quite uh, solid enough to make a dogma. But some Christians could be in this category, right? Like, um, I don't care what evidence you show me, the Bible says the world is 10,000 years old, therefore it is. Right? So it would be like a dogma. Okay, so ideology is a theory simplified for political action. It uses symbols. Anybody recognize any of these symbols? Oh, that one. We pray to it every two weeks, right? Down with the cobble. Yin yang. Yin yang. Well, that's the Islam crescent. I'll start, David. Yeah. How about this one? Is it? No. That's actually a Buddhist symbol. Um, and so sometimes these, these symbols can be misinterpreted. Yeah, like when some people see this, they see conspiracy for world domination. <laughs> but it's really just a, a symbol of, of uh, being Jewish. Um, it also employs slogan. So this is a famous slogan of the Communist um, Party of Marxism, which we're going to talk about in a few days. Workers of the world unite. Okay, a theory again is a model of the world. Okay, the way I explain theory is like this. I, I, I talk about theory when I teach Hawaiian history that we're going to look at Hawaiian history through a Hawaiian theory, a Hawaiian perspective. Okay, so a theory is like, it's kind of like a telescope or a kaleidoscope. Like when you look through a kaleidoscope and you twist it, what happens to what you're seeing? Changes, right? So when you talk about theory, you're not talking about what you're looking at, you're talking about the kaleidoscope itself. It's not what you're looking at, it's what you're looking through. Does that make sense? So everybody has a model of the world, a theory, and when they look at something, they don't see what's really there, they see an interpretation. Yeah, so um, in, when I went over the vocab cards, just um, for the demo yesterday, 
and one of the, the first card on there was agreement reality, right? Agreement reality. That one's not in the notes. So agreement reality is a reality that we, never, we haven't actually seen, but we all agree exists. So what's an example of agreement reality? Well, one of the main ones that we live in is the idea that economic growth is good. Right, you guys take economics, are you gonna be taking economics? Anybody take it already? Unless you had Kumu Momi who's kind of uh, an idealist. <laughs> She's super young. Uh, uh, you probably, it was assumed that economic growth is good in those, in those classes. <clears throat> but to think about it another way, uh, economic growth also damages the environment. Where does economic, where do products come from? They come from the environment, so therefore economic growth hurts productivity. So you might say economic growth is bad for the economy indirectly, right? I'm just, I'm not saying that, that I'm right or that side is right. I'm just saying there's other ways to look at it. Your, your theory is not always right. And that doesn't mean it doesn't work. Sometimes it'll still work even though it's um, kind of still wrong, which is a really interesting thing. <coughs> What's another theory? Let's just have a couple examples. Uh, so we can understand really what a theory is. Talk about evolution, theory of economic growth, yeah. Big Bang Theory. Big Bang Theory. Oh, you guys know about the show. You're thinking of the show, probably. <laughs> what is the Big Bang Theory? The actual theory? Oh, good. Yeah, so that, that at one point there was con a concentrated um, object that was infinitely dense and infinitely compact, and it exploded. That's the Big Bang. And they could actually measure when that happened, 14.6 uh, billion years ago. And um, they even can measure when light first appeared in the nanoseconds after it. Um, although they've been finding some, some of the new discoveries have caused them to go back and have to re, uh, to question the Big Bang Theory, to revise it. And there's even a theory out there now that says the Big Bang might not have been the first Big Bang, it might have been part of a series of bangs. <laughs> so that's the good thing about science, that's a good thing about why uh, this is political science, is that you always approach it with the th with the idea of this could be wrong, or the question, could this be wrong? Because if you don't, then you're moving into dogma, right? You start to have a mental block. You believe something so strongly that no amount of evidence to the contrary will persuade you. It's very important that you guys kind of get this when you're young, because once you get older, you know how people are set in their ways, can't teach an old dog new tricks. That really is true, like, uh, physiologically in your brain. People get locked into ways of viewing the world. And they can't be convinced even though all the evidence goes against it. That's not good. That means they're not thinking. So what are some of these political ideologies? Well, <clears throat> one that we're experiencing a lot of these days is called classical liberalism. Now this is kind of uh, uh, confusing because these are not the liberals. Like when we say liberals today, this, this is not them. This is more the conservatives today. Because it's the old liberalism. Okay, what is liberal? Liberal means, it's simple, you want change. What kind of change do they want? They want free markets mainly, economic freedom. Okay, so this, this theory was 
it, it, it developed in response to the older economic system called mercantilism. So mercantilism was uh, a system where the monarch, the king or the queen, gave a certain, usually a nobleman, the right to do a certain trade. So like Sir Francis Drake got the monopoly. Uh, he was the only one able to trade tobacco in Virginia with England. Okay, only he could do it. So that means there's no what? Competition. No competition. So that's mercantilism. It's these monopolies. It's uh, by royal decree, a certain person is allowed, given all um, the entire right to that entire industry. So this classical liberalism involved uh, saying, no, you should have competition. You should allow anybody to do it who can, who can do it. And what that does is it drives prices down and it makes life better for everybody. That's pretty much the ideal that we're living in right now. It's free markets. And it's getting more and more extreme. And I don't want to get too much into that. But this uh, globalization, that's what it's really about. Uh, the people who really believe in this theory most strongly today are what we can all call libertarians. I think I should stop there. In order to understand what a libertarian is, you need to understand this framework that Do this as an icebreaker as soon as I. Okay. I want to make sure people who might recognize this, but very relevant to what we're talking about today. What does it mean when you refer to the terms um, left and right, left wing, right wing? If you hear those terms, you probably have no idea what they're talking about. And so, what it is is a political spectrum that there's the left, we'll just call this the left, we'll call this the right. And when you say left and right, what you're really talking about is economics. And what you're talking about in economics is the idea of redistributing wealth. So on this side, the left believes you should redistribute wealth. What does that mean? It basically means tax the wealthy people and make programs for the poor. So you're taking money away from rich people and you're giving it to poor people. So you'd have a high tax on the wealthy. And in America, there's a moderately high tax on wealthy. It's 39%. Although there's a lot of um, loopholes to ways to get around that. right? Because corporations are global now. You, all you do to get away from taxes Move your money to another country, preferably a country with extremely low tax, like the Virgin Islands or um, the Cayman Islands. There's a lot of these places where people keep their money. They say that in, in, in offshore accounts like that, there's about 17 to 24 trillion dollars. What, what does that mean? It means one year of the entire American economy is kept overseas by American companies. So yeah, tax rate is kind of high on the wealthy, but they find ways around it. That's, that's the short answer. Uh, on the right, they say no redistribution of wealth. Okay, there's a lot of other issues when you talk about left and right. There's abortion, there's um, gun control, right? Those are big ones. But at its core, Left and right are about the distribution of wealth. So what it comes out to is a, a spectrum with left, right, and center. Okay, a lot of students are fond of saying, I'm right in the middle. <laughs> um, that's called sitting on the fence. Sitting on the fence. You don't want to go to this side of the fence, to this person's yard, or that side to that person's yard. Okay, now... That's the basic idea, but there's other, there are other um, factors. 
Because the world does not only consist of economics. There's also a social dimension. So what that does is it creates four, not two, two ends of a, of a spectrum, but four boxes, four quadrants. And let's, on the top we'll say these are people who believe in being socially free. Do whatever you want. I don't care what you do with your life. I only care about my life. That's, that's these people. And then there's the people at the bottom who say you should not be completely free. Now you might think, who's against freedom? Like, are these crazy people? No. They would say, you're not completely free because there's actually a rule book by which you should live your life. Maybe you've heard of it. It's called the Holy Bible. The Bible has rules. It has Ten Commandments. It has all these rules. And you should live your life by those. So what this does is it creates four quadrants. Those who believe in redistributing the wealth, but that you should be socially free. We call those progressives. So, Bernie Sanders, classic example. There are people who uh, believe, let's just do the other side, that there should not be redistribution of wealth, and you're not free, because the Bible says, do things this way, this way, this way. Those are called Christian conservatives. Okay, so, classic example, um, uh, Ted Cruz. He's so conservative, he's such a Christian conservative, he actually wants America to become a religious, a Christian-based country, what we call a theocracy. Now that's really extreme because there's only one theocracy in the world, and it's America's great ally, Iran. Is Iran America's ally? No, they're a bitter enemy, they're trying to stop them from building nuclear weapons. Iran is a theocracy, they're straight up theocracy. In fact, Iran is not called Iran, it's called the IRI, the Islamic Republic of Iran. That's the actual name of Iran. That's a theocracy. So in other words, Ted Cruz wants America to be like Iran, only Christian and not Muslim, of course. And that goes against complete, completely against ideas of separation of church and state, all of that. So he's kind of an extreme example. Another one is Sarah Palin. Sarah Palin is a... I didn't want to put her first because, you know, she also happens to be kind of a lunatic. <laughs> and I want to say that all Christian conservatives are lunatics, they're not. Okay. Then you have this quadrant here, which is a group of people who are saying, hey, let's be consistent. You should be free to keep all your own wealth. The government shouldn't be taking it from you. No redistribution. And you should be free to do whatever the heck you want. Those are the libertarians. Okay, so um, the Speaker of the House right now is uh, Paul Ryan. He's a libertarian. And there's a father and son in Congress, uh, Ron Paul and Rand Paul. They're, they're pretty prominent. If you follow politics at all, they're, they're in there. They're both libertarians. So what do libertarians believe? Um, basically, the only tax you should have in the country should be for military and police. That's it, nothing else. Absolutely no social welfare pro programs. And if they're consistent with their beliefs, they would also say no welfare for corporations. Because I saw this um, thing, this chart, I don't know if it's true, but uh, the average American, if you, were to, if you pay your taxes, you, you give $2 of your taxes goes to welfare for poor people, and about $56 goes to welfare for companies, mostly oil companies. So if you're against welfare, you should be thinking mostly about the companies, the wealthy companies that get welfare, not poor moms in the slums. Anyway, libertarians, at least they're kind of consistent. <laughs> they say, let's get rid of all welfare. And uh, the government's uh, government's duty is simply to protect private property. That's it. So for that you need a military and you also need police. Okay, 
And then you have a group here who believe in the redistribution of wealth, but they say you're not free. They have a rule book that you should live by. It's not the Bible. It's called the Communist Manifesto. It's not very prevalent in the U.S. This would be somebody like Joseph Stalin. Right? Because in, 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 in the Soviet Union, yeah? Remember Mr. Arpo, the principal? He, his degree was in Soviet studies. A lot of people don't know that. His master's degree in Soviet studies. He wrote three chapters of his dissertation. He's on the way to get a PhD in Soviet studies. So he's interested in things like this, the Russian scorpion submarine. See? Julian. Ako. That's his cup. Top secret. And uh, so he used to study these things. Um, because at the time when he was at Kamehameha, this was the biggest threat. Right now, people don't even, it's almost like, people kind of forgot that that was going on. Okay, everybody stand up. <clears throat> okay, so I think you know what the icebreaker is. Which quadrant would you put yourself in? Now let me just say something that I find that uh, students answer incorrectly. If you believe that Bill Gates earned every penny of his $76 billion that he has, don't call yourself a progressive, because you're not. Right? Because if, if progressives had their way, he wouldn't have $76 billion anymore because it would be taxed. Okay, that's, that's my only little uh, disclaimer. Does everybody understand the four quadrants? Any communists? <laughs> yeah. Libertarian. Libertarian. Okay. Oh, let's take a vote. Oh, let's take a vote. Progressive. Progressive. So Bill Gates doesn't deserve his money. I just say that because a lot of people call themselves progressive, but if you ask them that question, they would say, no, Bill Gates earned every penny of it, even though he stole the main idea that got him. Uh, he never gave to char anything to charity for 30 years. Yeah. Progressive. I thought you guys were realists. <laughs> Conservatives? say what I am, um, you know, we have this idea that a teacher should be completely neutral, and once you get up to university, which is where we're going, you realize that's just a joke. The idea that anybody is neutral is just wrong. Everybody has a viewpoint, right? Everybody has a lens that they look through the world with, okay? And my lens is progressive. Uh, part of that is generational. It's been interesting because my whole teaching career I've taught millennials, and in the beginning they were all libertarians. But after 2008, we've seen a shift towards progressive. It's not just Obama, it's the financial crisis. Millennials are not doing well. The average salary of a millennial 
in many states is twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars. Like that's how much I pay in tax, and I'm a teacher. It's not enough money to live on, so they've started to embrace more radical politics. So that's been very interesting. Okay, so when I say uh, Paul Ryan is a libertarian, I think now you know what that means. Socially free, but no distribution of wealth. You know, at least they're consistent. At least they're consistent, right? Freedom economically and freedom uh, socially. Right, so libertarians, and those libertarians of you, they believe in legalization of drugs. They're, um, they're in favor of abortion. So they break with the rest of the uh, Republicans over, who are over here. Yeah, A lot of people say that with Trump, the Republican Party is collapsing. And part of that collapse is because part of the libertarians are, part of the Republicans are libertarians, and part of them are Christian conservatives. Whereas with the Democrats, None of them are communists. <laughs> They're all some degree of progressive, right? You can be towards the middle, like Hillary Clinton, I would say, is very close to the center, whereas Sanders is kind of way out here. But in the same quadrant, but still pretty different from each other. Uh, so Democrats at least have some measure of unity. Okay. We could take a short break from the from the lecture and look at the uh, video about Plato, so we can understand him a little bit better. So this uh, it, it's a YouTube channel actually that we're going to be watching a lot of, called the School of Life. Okay. Better remember that. You'll remember that by the end. The School of Life, it's a very interesting and useful and I think a positive uh, program. And it's started by a man named Alain de Botton. It's like a French name, but he's actually Swiss, but grew up in England. So he's kind of an international guy. He has a degree in philosophy. Um, I'll just tell you some of these are are R-rated because they're not for schools, they're for adults who are done with school and still haven't figured out the world yet. And so he uses philosophy and uh, psychology and other things to get people to kind of um, have a better life, not be so hard on yourself. So a lot of them are things like how to, uh, how to deal with capitalism, things like that. This video has had a million views, which is, for a philosophy video, pretty amazing. Athens, 2,400 years ago. It's a compact place. Only about a quarter of a million people live here. There are fine baths, theatres, temples, shopping arcades, and gymnasiums. It's warm for more than a half a year. <laughs> this is also home to the world's first true and probably greatest philosopher, Plato. Born into a prominent and wealthy family in the city, Plato devoted his life to one goal, helping people to reach a state of what he termed eudaimonia, or fulfillment. Can you hear this? often confused with Socrates. Socrates was an older friend who taught Plato a lot, writing books. Plato was so philosopher. 36, all dialogues, beautifully crafted scripts of imaginary discussions are 
in which Socrates is always allotted a starring role. London, the Republic, the Symposium, the Laws, the Mino, and the Apology. Plato had four big ideas for me. Let me just... Uh... Should I start from the beginning? Yeah. Can you turn that light off? Okay, I got a little bit more volume here. Athens, 2,400 years ago. It's a compact place. Only about a quarter of a million people live here. There are fine baths, theatres, temples, shopping arcades and gymnasiums. It's warm for more than half the year. This is also home to the world's first true and probably greatest philosopher, Plato. Born into a prominent and wealthy family in the city, Plato devoted his life to one goal, helping people to reach a state of what he termed eudaimonia, or fulfilment. Plato is often confused with Socrates. Socrates was an older friend who taught Plato a lot but didn't write any books. Plato wrote lots of them, 36 all dialogues, beautifully crafted scripts of imaginary discussions in which Socrates is always allotted a starring role, among them the Republic, the Symposium, the Laws, the Mino, and the Apology. Plato had four big ideas for making life more fulfilled. First big idea, think more. We rarely give ourselves time to think carefully and logically about our lives and how to lead them. Sometimes we just go along with what the Greeks called doxa, or popular opinions. In the 36 books he wrote, Plato showed this common sense to be riddled with errors, prejudice, and superstition. Fame is great. Follow your heart. Money is the key to a good life. The problem is, popular opinions edge us towards the wrong values, careers, and relationships. Plato's answer is, know yourself. It means doing a special kind of therapy, philosophy, subjecting your ideas to examination rather than acting on impulse. If you strengthen your self-knowledge, you don't get so pulled around by feelings. Plato compared the role of our feelings to being dragged dangerously along by a group of wild horses. In honour of his mentor and friend Socrates, this kind of examination is called a Socratic discussion. You can have it with yourself, or ideally with another person who isn't trying to catch you out, but wants to help you clarify your own ideas. Second big idea, let your lover change you. That sounds weird if you think that love means finding someone who wants you just the way you are. In a symposium, Plato's play about a dinner party where a group of friends drink too much and get talking about love, sex and relationships, Plato says, true love is admiration. In other words, the person you need to get together with should have very good qualities, which you yourself lack. Let's say they should be really brave or organised or warm and sincere. By getting close to this person, you can become a little like they are. The right person for us helps us grow to our full potential. For Plato, in a good relationship, a couple shouldn't love each other exactly as they are right now. They should be committed to educating each other and to enduring the stormy passages this inevitably involves. Each person should want to seduce the other into becoming a better version of themselves. Three, decode the message of beauty. Everyone pretty much likes beautiful things, but Plato was the first to ask, why do we like them? He found a fascinating reason. Beautiful objects are whispering important truths to us about the good life. We find things beautiful when we unconsciously sense in them qualities we need but are missing in our lives. Gentleness, harmony, balance, peace, strength. Beautiful objects, therefore, have a really important function. They help to educate our souls. Ugliness is a serious matter too. It parades dangerous and damaged characteristics in front of us. It makes it harder to be wise, kind and calm. Plato sees art as therapeutic. It's the duty of poets and painters, and nowadays novelists, TV producers and designers, help us to live good lives. 4. Reform society. Plato spent a lot of time thinking how the government and society should ideally be. He was the world's first utopian thinker. In this, he was inspired by Athens' great rival, Sparta. This was a city-sized machine for turning out great soldiers. Everything the Spartans did 
how they raised their children, how their economy was organised, whom they admired, how they had sex, what they ate, was tailored to that one goal. And Sparta was hugely successful from a military point of view. But that wasn't Plato's concern. He wanted to know, how could a society get better at producing not military power, but fulfilled people? In his book, The Republic, Plato identifies a number of changes that should be made. Athenian society was very focused on the rich, like the louche aristocrat Alcibiades, and sports celebrities like the boxer Milo of Croton. Plato wasn't impressed. It really matters who we admire, because celebrities influence our outlook, ideas, and conduct, and bad heroes give glamour to flaws of character. Plato therefore wanted to give Athens new celebrities, replacing the current crop with ideally wise and good people he called guardians, models for everyone's good development. These people would be distinguished by their record of public service, their modesty and simple habits, their dislike of the limelight, and their wide and deep experience. They would be the most honoured and admired people in society. He also wanted to end democracy in Athens. He wasn't crazy. He just observed how few people think properly before they vote, and therefore we get very substandard rulers. He didn't want to replace democracy with a horrid dictatorship, but he wanted to prevent people from voting until they'd started to think rationally. That is, until they'd become philosophers. Otherwise, government would just be a kind of mob rule. To help the process, Plato started a school, the Academy, in Athens, which lasted a good 300 years. There, pupils learned not just maths and spelling, but also how to be good and kind. His ultimate goal was that politicians should become philosophers, the world will not be right, he said, until kings become philosophers or philosophers kings. Okay, so that was Plato in six minutes, which uh, is basically impossible. But. And we will watch that. So see, there's a lot of these. Um, we're going to talk. About, we're going to watch this one later on. Uh, might watch this one, maybe even today or Thursday, but there's Aristotle. So there's something I, I recommend you could even watch on your own. <clears throat> and they're very practical. Let's see. Okay. Okay, let's try to finish this up quickly. <clears throat> but before we do, um, are there any questions about their reading? This is the moment. Are you going to let it wash over you or ask? Questions about the reading? Okay, so <clears throat> we kind of understand what classical liberalism is and libertarianism. Yeah? Classical conservatism. This one wasn't on the chart that I made. All it is is saying that it's saying keep things the same. Change is dangerous. So what they're saying was uh, that there's a reason why certain things are done a certain way. Over long periods of time, we've developed traditions, and we may have forgot the purpose of why the traditions were developed the way that they were. Right? So every year, having Founders' Day and singing the same damn songs over and over again, right? Tradition. But maybe we forgot a hundred years ago why that was done that way, and maybe there's a good reason that we just don't know. So don't change it. Keep it the same. That's what classical conservatism would say. Uh, the most, the best known uh, classical conservative was Edmund Burke, and there is actually a School of Life video about him, but it doesn't really deal with the core of this. It's uh, somewhat on, on, on the side. Um, but more, something more contempor contemporary... Uh, would be gay marriage. Some people who are against gay marriage would say, you know, there's a reason why marriage is the way it is. 
without gay marriage, which was, um, in the old days, they thought that it, the entire purpose of marriage was to have children. This idea of things we have now, like dinks. Do you know what that means? Double income, no kids. That's the ash right there. Double income, no kids. The idea that you would marry somebody and not have kids was kind of unheard of, unless you couldn't have kids. Uh, but since the 60s, when they had you know, birth control was created, you had the choice of whether to have kids or not. And some people choose, many people choose, to get married and not have kids. And this, this, this word dinks is kind of, it's slightly insulting because those people, imagine having a double income and no kids. Those people end up becoming pretty wealthy. Um, often, when, you, in the, when the woman doesn't have any kids, she can develop her professional career to uh, uh, as high an extent as the man or higher. So you got these two professional incomes, nothing to really spend it on except yourself, and so they end up living these luxurious lives. Um, classical conservatives would say there's something wrong with that, and there's something wrong with this gay marriage. The purpose is children. Of course, those were in the days uh, when there weren't, uh, there wasn't a population overpopulation crisis, right? So, I would say that's, you know, the, don't disregard classical conservatism. Uh, most millennials are in favor of gay marriage. All I would say is don't disregard this out of hand, but keep in mind that yeah, maybe there, there is some truth. Maybe some traditions do have some kind of merit behind them. But other, other ones uh, become out of date, right? The context changes. Yeah? Um, I, could, I could get into that, but I want to be sure to get, into, get to the end. Okay, now we have the theory where we have one person. Oh, Evan, was that you? Communist? <laughs> Communism, the lower left quadrant in our little chart. <coughs> Communism can be traced back to Karl Marx's book. It's a very, very thin book, The Communist Manifesto. It's more like a, more like a pamphlet, but it kind of synthesized a lot of uh, thinking that he'd been doing over decades. Um, it has some famous quotes. Basically, and I think I said this yesterday, history is the history of class struggles, basically. Uh, I mentioned that as one of the views of of international politics, that it's all about class, social class, poor, middle class, rich. Another famous quote, workers of the world unite, I mentioned that earlier. Uh, the thing about Marx is that he was a philosopher, but one of, another thing he said was, uh, philosophers up to this point have interpreted the world, the point is to change it. And that's interesting that he was the one who said that because he never saw the change in his lifetime, but after he died, only a little while after he died, there was a revolution pretty much around the world, and it got to the point by the middle of the 20th century where one-third of the world was living under governments that were based on the ideas of Marx. Because um, the Soviet Union, which included a lot of the smaller European countries, the whole of Eastern Europe, China, Cuba, North Korea, uh, they were all communists. So it ended up being a third of the world living under communist regimes. And that led to the Cold War. Uh, if you guys haven't seen Bridge of Spies, have you seen Bridge of Spies, Tom Hanks? Uh, it's about the Cold War and spies going back and forth between the communist side and the Americans. Um, or a movie called Trumbo, which is starring the guy from Breaking Bad. It's about a writer who was um, blacklisted for being a communist in America. He wrote the screenplay for the movie Hawaii with Mary Poppins from 1966, um, which I show in my, in my class. He was a communist. 
Okay, what are communist beliefs? Basically, the government should take control of uh, the means of production. So in that case, they meant mainly factories. The things that produce, if the government controls them, it can spread the benefits out equally. Okay, so if you were living in a communist country, if you were a mechanic or a doctor or any other kind of job, janitor, you make the same amount of pay. There's only two communist countries left. Anybody know? North Korea? Okay, China is communist in name, but not in practice, yeah. They have a communist party, but they don't act like communists at all. They're capitalists. The other one is Cuba. So North Korea and Cuba are the last two communist countries. If you don't count China, which you shouldn't count China. Okay, then there's democratic socialism. Who's that? You guys feeling the burn? All you progressives? Um, basically, what they try to do is combine the strengths of capitalism with the strengths of communism. And some of the countries that you mentioned as being the happiest countries in the world, Norway, Finland, Denmark. Finland, by the way, has the best education system in the world. And it's not based on excellence, it's based on equality. Right? America has a bad education system, right? We know this. Do you know that nine out of 10 college students don't know who won the Civil War? Um, seven out of ten don't know who the United States got its independence from. So, to me, it's like, why bother being American? Why bother um, being patriotic if you have no idea about the origin of your own country? It's really, really bad. So, America has a bad education system. It's not because the good schools aren't good, right? Harvard, Yale, Princeton, those are best schools in the world. But the average is really bad because Americans are not focused on equality. And that was what Bernie Sanders, with his political revolution, as he called it, was trying to change. Saying we need more equality in the system. We need to be more like those Scandinavian countries that you guys mentioned. We need high taxes, especially on the wealthy. We need to close all those loopholes. So we can get the benefits of socialism and the benefits of capitalism combined. But looks like Bernie lost. Barely. Um, somewhat similar, I would say that uh, Hillary Clinton is in this camp here, reform liberalism. Um, that there's nothing wrong really with the system as it is, you just need to tweak it. You need to make minor adjustments here and there, and you need to improve access to the system. That's basically a, a moderate liberal point of view, that there's nothing fundamentally wrong with American institutions, but you just need to make minor adjustments. Yeah? If uh, Native Hawaiians, do you know that Native Hawaiians graduating from public schools, their graduation rate from college is 9%? 9%, so not even 1 in 10 public school graduates from Native Hawaiian are finishing college. To me, that's like a catastrophe. I mean, what, what, what are we comparing it to? Uh, the American average is 29%. So not everybody goes to college, but about a third do, and a third finish. Two thirds go to college and one third finish. That's, that's what it is. Um, and so, if you have a problem with that, only 9% of Native Hawaiian public school graduates are graduating from college. What do you do? You make a program. The Native Hawaiians in College Program, some nice acronym, and then that is how you fix the problem. That would be a reform liberalist approach. Um, a progressive approach would be to question the entire system. What is the basis of even Hawaiians even being part of America that led to this problem. That's a more fundamental kind of critique. <clears throat> so people in this, uh, the New Deal, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, FDR, he was in this camp. And I would say uh, Clinton. Um, as far as economics, you probably hear about this guy, John Maynard Keynes, when you take economics. It's a moderate approach to economics along the same lines of what I said. 
Then there's fascism. Fascism. Some people are calling Trump a fascist because his style of so-called leadership is to get the mainstream to, uh, to release all their hate against marginal groups, such as Muslims, Muslims women, Mexicans, right? He said Mexicans are all rapists. That's interesting because the majority of California is Mexicans. California is now like 53% Latino. They're not all Mexican, but the vast majority of those are Mexican. So California is a state of, oh, uh, every one out of every two people is a rapist, according to Trump. I mean, it's, it's ludicrous. It's ludicrous what he's saying, but it's not about logic anymore, right? And that's, that's the disturbing part uh, about what's happening is... We're seeing trends that have happened before. Because Americans don't know their history, they are repeating. I mean, that's the biggest cliche ever, right? Those who don't know their history are doomed to repeat it. George Santanaya said that. Uh, a lot of people are saying the kind of rhetoric that Trump is spouting, and also the economic situation that we're in right now, is similar to Nazi Germany. Or, uh, in this case, that there is... Um, Benito Mussolini. He was really the fascist. Now, what does the word mean? The fascia is it's a symbol for anybody know? Fascist? Um, it's supposed to be like an axe handle like this. And, and then what they do is they take a bunch of sticks and they wrap the sticks around the axe handle. You know, beautiful. Try to contain your awe skills here. And they wrap it with a tight string, and what those sticks do is protect the axe handle from cracking. Now the idea is the dictator, the, the dictator is the axe handle, and the people are the sticks. So the people shield the dictator from being broken. That's literally well, the, 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 the Latin term fascia, or Italian fascia. That's what the image means. Okay, so if it was Trump in the middle, all his supporters who have actually raised their hands like this to Trump, who said everybody who's going to vote for Trump and loves the USA, raise your hand, and they all went like this. Yeah. <laughs> so so they, they don't pretend to believe in democracy. They don't believe in democracy. Um, they want a government without dissent, right? Democracy assumes there's going to be dissent. The democracy is the, the dialogue between dissenting groups, and they come to some kind of agreement. It's a, sometimes an ugly process, but dissent is part of it. Fascism is, pushes that out. Um, when Mussolini was running Italy as a fascist dictator, some of the commentators, like English people who believe in democracy, they, say, they would say, well, you know, Mussolini actually, he makes the trains run on time. Because in Italy, it was notorious for trains being usually late. They'd be like four hours late. But just to be super, just to be inconsistent, they would occasionally be an hour early. Right? So if they were always four hours late, that would kind of be okay, because you would know, oh, it says nine, we know it's going to be here at one, so we'll just go down at 12.30. But no, occasionally they'd be early. It was super inconsistent. He had no idea when you needed to be at the train station to get where you're going. But Mussolini said, if you, you guys in charge of the, rail, the rails, if you don't make the trains run on time, uh, you'll be executed. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the trains are running on time. So English people who would visit there to go and look at the nice museums and the galleries, they said, hey, get these trains to run on time. That's kind of nice. <laughs> but the cost is huge. But it, fascism is something, if you call somebody a fascist today, it's, a, it's an incredible insult. It's like calling them a Nazi. But back then, it was actually a theory that people believed in. 
Okay, so this last part of the, of the lecture, I think, is good for a first lecture because it's asking the questions of um, kind of introductory questions. What is politics, anyway? Well, like I've been saying, politics is everywhere. Another way to say that is it's ubiquitous. It's always all around you. There is a definition of power that we covered earlier, the ability to get someone to do something they otherwise wouldn't. Um, the greatest philosopher of power, in my view, was this bald man here. His name was Michel Foucault. Everybody say, Michel Foucault. Michel Foucault. This might be the first class to teach him in Kamehameha, but uh, I'm not sure. But this is, uh, if you end up in the political science department at UH, it's all about this guy. I think we have a shrine to him in the back of the department up there at, at Manoa. Um, he had an incredibly penetrating study of power. He studied power in all its forms. So he said, uh, he, he looked at the question of abnormality. And I'll just talk about it very briefly. He looked at things that we consider abnormal. So sexual deviance. He himself was uh, homosexual. Uh, and he would go on these sexual rampages where he would disappear and uh, who knows what he was doing for days and days, and then he would appear back. Anyway, needless to say, he was one of the early victims of AIDS in 1984, before they even knew really what it was. Anyway, he was interested in things that are not normal. Um, sexual deviance, uh, insanity, punishment, criminality, and that seems like different fields, but they had the common uniting factor of um, telling us what power really is about. Because if, if, this, if the government tells you what is normal, then they can control you. Right? They're telling you, if you do this, it's normal. If you do this, it's abnormal. But the thing he noticed was that what's normal and abnormal changed over time. Right? So if, if what's normal and abnormal changes over time, then that's not about actually being normal. right? It's about controlling you. Does that make sense? So when they tell you gay marriage is abnormal, or uh, you know something you do in your own bedroom as a consenting adult is abnormal, what are they really doing? Are they really trying? Do they really care about your health, or are they trying to control you? I mean, that that's the question. Uh, he had. I, I won't go to. We're going to talk about Foucault later on, but. Um, he actually could show how power could reach down from the high heights, like Obama and corporations, reach down right into your physical body. That's what he called biopolitics. And that it was all done through discourse. It's all done through discussion back and forth. OK. And lastly, if that's what, what is politics. What is political science? Well, it's not really a science, especially if you end up at UH. Um, we are really kind of freaks over there. Uh, this class that we're doing right now is very, very conventional. Uh, it's very conventional, and the reason is, I, you know, you're, it's kind of a, an experiment, right, of giving a college class to high school kids. And so I want it to be not some freak show class where I just make up some stuff and call it political science. I want it to actually be political science where any school you go to, they'll recognize this as a political science class. Okay, so having said that though, what is political science? It's really the study of power in all its forms, in any form. So this is my friend here. He's a, a Japanese Rastafarian. Back in the 1990s, he was regarded as the most brilliant student in the political science department. He got a scholarship, which is basically from the emperor of Japan to go to UH to get his PhD. And what he produced was a dissertation that led to this book here, From Kung Fu to Hip Hop. His dissertation was about Bruce Lee, Jimi Hendrix, and Bob Marley. Not things you would usually associate with political science, right? But what I'm trying to show you is that you can be anyone, you can be yourself, like Masa here, Masa Kato is his name, um, and you can study 
whatever you want because power is everywhere. Everything has some kind of component of politics. Okay, that's why people are writing about Iron Man and Avengers and Bruce Lee, Harry Potter. There was a guy who wrote a dissertation on the politics of surfing. Actually got his PhD, it's like the politics of surfing. Is that a real thing or just an, ex uh, an excuse to go ride waves? Uh, no, you was actually studying like the politics of the lineup, right? Who gets to go next on the next set and all of this. Uh, the hui. The hui? Yes? Blank stairs means yes, I know what you're talking about? Yeah. Okay? That's political, right? They get to say who can catch waves on these certain breaks to make sure it doesn't get overwhelmed with tourists, right? They have power. And sometimes people abuse power, right? So they're like little local kids who go on the waves and they like spray the, the hollies and they make fun of them because the hui's backing them up. Yeah. It is a little bit messed up, right? But there's, uh, but it's a legitimate thing to study, okay? So that's what I'm trying to explain is that you can actually study anything, especially at UH. If you go off to Harvard, I wouldn't recommend to do that. Um, you want to be more conventional. Okay. Okay, so we have like one minute. Um, and I, I, I wanted to tell you one more thing you have to do which is a response to the chapter. I think I forgot to say that yesterday. So you actually have three things. One is um, to read the chapter. And so tonight is the rest of it. That is from page 26 to the end. And you need to do your bio. Three quarters of page, single space, and then also um, a one page double space response to the chapter. Okay. Normally, I would try to give you a sample about what a good one looks like. I, I, the reason I'm not doing that is if I give you a sample of what a good response to this chapter looks like, then I've sort of given away what you're supposed to write in there. But once you've done the one, I'll give you a sample that you can use for the next one. At least to see what, I'm, what kind of things I'm looking for. Okay, any questions, comments? It's gonna be due on Thursday. Thursday, everything's due on Thursday. Because tomorrow's kind of a, uh, we're not doing work like this tomorrow. We have our trip to UH, so it gives you an extra day. Okay, actually we have, um, so uh, we have this new schedule. Yeah, so from for the next half hour from 9.10 right now until 9.40 is a half hour break for you to start working and to have me there to, to ask questions and help you. And then they talk about this yesterday. Yeah. And then you have another half hour at the end of English 100. Yeah. So I would use this time to read, start writing your response. Um, well, if I were you, I'd go for a five or ten minute break and then come back and use the rest. Okay, any more questions?